And if you, if you hear a background noise, my computer is overheating a bit because of all the tabs I have open on my computer. So just uh, ignore that for the time being. So a Hurricane Dorian is still a Category 4 storm, but the category is kind of a moot point and uh, is really just for bookkeeping purposes at this point. Very dangerous hurricane. Um, you know, a strike on the, the northern Bahamas, the out islands of the Bahamas up here on Grand Bahama Island and the Abaco Islands are looking very likely and uh, certainly concerning. I'm going to stop this animation to see if that will make my computer calm down here. Um, you know, a strike looking very likely and uh, certainly a concerning situation. And it's becoming a game of inches with Dorian in terms of the actual, uh, the projected track here. We really want to... Uh, I really want to emphasize that how fragile this this track is and how very small changes can have very big impacts on who sees what and I said the other day in a, in, in a different forecast I'm just going to animate this and just ignore the background noise um, I said the other night in another broadcast talking about how um, you know someone's going to get more than they bargained for with the storm someone's going to get uh, you know, a surprise with the storm and someone's going to get exactly what was forecast. That's the nature of meteorology, the nature of the beast. Uh, that's just kind of how things work. And, uh, you know, that's what we're dealing with, with a game of inches and a game of miles with the storm. So uh, you can see here on the infrared satellite, this is provided by the Goes East satellite that was launched a few years ago, providing a very detailed look, updating every minute. So we have this very high resolution composite. Uh, check out the, the dark color and the very intense core of Dorian and how uh, cold these cloud tops are. So when we have summertime thunderstorms, you know, they pop up really high into the troposphere, into the atmosphere, and they're cold, but they're nowhere near this. The, this is approaching, you know, temperatures of uh, greater than negative 70 degrees Celsius. It's a very cold cloud tops, meaning they're very high, meaning Dorian is very powerful. And you can look at this image and just see the, the power emanating from it. Uh, you know, there's a saying in nature that the, the prettier it looks, the more dangerous it is. Um, and in this case for Dorian, that certainly rings true as um, it's a very symmetrical storm, meaning it's very organized, uh, very intense. I think the last update winds were 150 miles per hour sustained, which is an average over three minutes. Um, so a very powerful hurricane. And a key thing I want to show you in this before I move off of this graphic is that the key to the forecast is that Dorian needs to start gaining latitude. Um, as soon as possible in order to to for this track to verify so if you watch this is over the past it looks like maybe the, the past hour or so and if we zoom in you know Dorian is not really gaining latitude I've lost my marker here uh, it's not gaining latitude and that's concerning uh, because it really needs to start pulling a little bit further north to for this track to verify and if it does that then the track will verify and you know the expected conditions will verify um, the Bahamas are expected the northern Bahamas are expected to take a, a direct hit from Dorian or the eye is going to pass a very direct and, and keep in mind that the eye doesn't have to be doesn't have to make landfall to have extreme impacts with Hurricane Matthew a few years ago the eye never touched Florida uh, but still caused over three billion dollars in economic losses and um, several fatalities so it doesn't have to be on land for it to be a high impact storm and Dorian just kind of riding along westward and if it doesn't start gaining latitude and what I mean by that if it doesn't start having a northward component to its track that could spell trouble for the current forecast and uh, may warrant a nudge farther back to the west for the official hurricane track because uh, that's a key thing if it, if it starts uh, gaining a northern component to its track then that means that there's still going to be you know the impacts that are forecast to be expected will materialize um, but if it keeps just barreling west and doesn't really obey uh, the forecast and doesn't abide by what the model guidance has it doing, uh, like I said, it's a game of miles. It's a game of, of inches with Dorian, and it's a very sensitive track, and small tracks can have big differences. But enough on this graphic. I'm going to pause this so my computer will stop uh, making those noises. And it's starting to show up on this radar composite that is uh, based out of the Bahamas. The, we don't have the same Doppler radar technology that we have in the United States available in Bahamas. Uh, but we do have this composite that is from this uh, bahamasweather.org site and this .bs extension indicates this from the Bahamas so um, someone tweeted this out and I clicked it and thought it was uh, interesting I hadn't seen any radar sources for the Bahamas but it's it's a good source to see you can see the eye of Hurricane Dorian um, on the radar within this range uh, probably from a radar position somewhere on the uh, northern Abaco Island up here uh, near Marsh Harbor so that's starting to materialize and again the northern bahamas will start seeing these effects tomorrow afternoon so overnight tonight dorian's expected to scoot this way and just how far north of the islands does it get does it cross over the islands does it keep bearing west does it 
start to drop south a little bit, you know, these storms tend to wobble, especially when they're larger. Um, they can kind of create their own eddies and vortices and ebbs and flows within them, and they can kind of wobble around and create problems for the track. And, and in this case, wobbles are very... Uh, wobbles would be very dangerous for this track because a lot of people I think have been kind of caught off guard or have let their guard down rather um, on the eastern coast of Florida and I'm not saying that that's you know something that's going to to still happen but east eastern Florida is still in the National Hurricane Center cone for a reason and if I pull that up uh, this you know uncertainty still lies here this cone of uncertainty by the National Hurricane Center indicates where the center of the storm is expected to be um, uh, within the forecast range. It doesn't mean that impacts are going to be limited to here. Dorian is kind of a small hurricane, relatively speaking, but the impacts will be felt uh, several hundred miles outside of the eye. The, the eye of the hurricane does not have to make landfall to have a very high amount of impact. So uh, keep that in mind. The official hurricane center track has, uh, I believe this, this is indicating 8 a.m. tomorrow on Sunday, September the 1st, and then uh, by 2 p.m. tomorrow, with the afternoon of Sunday, so 2 p.m. Eastern time, is uh, when Dorian would be approaching the uh, northern Abaco Island and starting to conditions would really start to begin to deteriorate, begin to deteriorate there, and then affecting uh, the uh, Grand Bahama Island by 2 a.m. on Monday, and then again, so 24 hours between this point here and this point here. And someone asked earlier, the M on this forecast graphic uh, refers to major hurricane. So it's either going to be an uh, H, an M, an S, or a D. And uh, D means depression, S means tropical storm strength, H means hurricane strength, category one or two, and M stands for major hurricane, which is category three or higher. Uh, Dorian is currently category four, so that's why these M's are still here. It's expected to uh, hold steady in its intensity. And today it actually moved over some waters where some forecasters were thinking that it was going to at least uh, remain steady and not necessarily weaken, but not intensify. And it kind of defied those odds, even over a patch of uh, cooler water. So that's something we have to keep in mind. You know, these storms, they can kind of draw up a very, very dense ocean heat content and can, again, have a mind of their own. So that's something we have to pay attention to. In terms of the uh, impact in the Carolinas up here, again, we're still in this cone of uncertainty, and this is still five days out. So while the storm is only about 650, 700 miles away from the Carolinas at this point, and about 300 miles away from, from eastern Florida down here, uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty. And, and I want to stop using that, that buzzword uncertainty because after a while it kind of becomes, you know, you're kind of numb to that word after a while. Uh, but but what I want to say is that we're still uh, you don't need to let your guard down with Dorian. There's still a lot in play, and the Carolinas are still very much at risk for um, you know very intense hurricane, uh, very extreme hurricane impacts from Hurricane Dorian. So when I say that, you know, coastal flooding, inland rain that's very heavy. You know, think of Hurricane Matthew, think of Florence, and um, high winds that could cause widespread power outages. Those are still very real possibilities because of this storm skirting so close to the coast so in terms of how that translates into you know wind speeds this is a graphic from the national hurricane center the earliest reasonable arrival time of tropical storm force winds and these um colors indicate the probability of the tropical storm force winds arriving and uh, so you know here in the carolinas by uh, overnight tuesday through uh, wednesday morning of next week so that would be september the third and fourth uh, still having those those tropical storm force winds arriving at that time with higher probabilities down at the coast as you'd expect the storm is currently forecast to remain off the coast but it's very possible that it could track a little bit closer to the coast and then those probabilities would shift inland and then there's also the possibility that the storm could track a little bit farther off the coast which would be good news and the worst conditions would be kept offshore again it's a it's a game of miles very slight changes in the track if if dorian does not continue to gain latitude tonight and into tomorrow uh, that spells trouble for the rest of the track because that determines a when it begins to make its turn so if it keeps sinking or not sinking but if it keeps tracking westward and doesn't gain a northern component to its its movement then all of this kind of ticks westward you know 20 25 to 50 miles so that has uh, the short term uh events of the storm have a large and very significant impact on the extended track of the storm, but any impacts would not be felt here in the Carolinas, or specifically North Carolina, until about Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, um, Wednesday into Thursday, when the winds would, would arrive. And then as, in terms of the rainfall, this is the rainfall prediction from the National Hurricane Center. Uh, that orange color jumps out at me. Um, 
yeah, I see uh, some comments coming um, now. I'll get to those in just a moment. Uh, thanks for everyone who's tuning in. Just wanting to do another live stream. I've been doing these nightly now, just kind of updating you on Dorian. Still a very intense hurricane and talking about the uh, the rainfall impact now. And uh, it's still going to be a lot of rain. You see this purple hue down here over Abaco Island uh, north of that because Dorian is expected to just kind of park itself over this area and create just a headache. I'm very worried for these two islands because Dorian is just forecast to just stall out there and sit there and cause, you know, major hurricane conditions for, for several hours, if not, you know, a day and a half. So uh, certainly a concerning situation down there. Um, Eastern Florida has been cut, you know, out of these heavy rainfall totals. But again, if this could very well tick back west tomorrow, if um, or tonight, even with with new guidance, if it comes in and the problem today has been um, the ridge that was sampled out. And I'll explain this more on a uh, on a model run in a couple of slides here that I have. But basically aircraft reconnaissance. So hurricane hunters have been flying out and sampling the air mass outside of the storm. They don't just sample the hurricane itself. They also sample the air around it. And that data is ingested into the models. And that can be a very key development because if you observe the rest of the environment around the storm and it is not what is being um, shown in the models, that's concerning because then you have a discrepancy. So that can have differences on the forecast. Um, that can that can have a big play. And, and today that's been the case. There's been the ever so slightest tick back to the west in the afternoon run of the American model, the global forecast system or GFS for short, because the, the uh, ridge out in the Atlantic is um a little bit stronger than was depicted in the models and with that ridge being stronger that continues to push dorian farther west and if it push you know if if dorian tracks 25 miles farther west than the current track over here you know let's say dorian uh, takes a track more you know just like just a couple of miles more than up into greensboro area then you're getting into the tropical storm forest winds then you're getting the heavier rain and then wilmington's taking direct hit from probably a you know, a, a category two hurricane by then it's going to, I'll, I'll need to explain, uh, someone asked why is it expected to weaken around here? So I'm going to explain that in a minute too. Um, I'll explain that when I pull the storm surge map up, but uh, you know, if it tracks 25 miles farther west, then a lot more people are going to have a bad day in the Carolinas here on Wednesday, Thursday with heavy rain, with high winds and with widespread power outages is very possible because the wind is just relentless with the hurricane. That's why the power outages are so common because they're not meant to take, you know, just sustained winds of 35 miles per hour with gust. That's like having a severe thunderstorm for several hours um, at, at a time. That's kind of what the, the hurricane is and why it causes that. But again, what if Dorian kind of speeds up overnight? What if we wake up and it's a little farther north than forecast? Then it could be 25 miles on the east side. Then the triad may have a, a cloudy, you know, dreary day with a couple of rain showers on Wednesday, Thursday, and then coastal North Carolina just gets tropical storm force conditions. It is such a variable uh, situation, and Dorian is such a small storm right now that it's a game of miles, and, and miles can make all the difference, and you have to keep in mind that forecasters are taking an average of the best information that we have, and that is, it's a hard thing to communicate to the public because to the public, it uh, still, you know, it doesn't really... You want to know what's going to happen at your location, and that's that's the meteorologist's job is to do that. But at the same time, when we have uncertainty in the science and we try to explain that to you, it comes across as you know being clueless. And these hurricanes are just so hard to forecast because they can have a mind of their own. So just keep that in mind when you keep hearing the word uncertainty and error. And you know, like here talking about a 200 mile error track and forecast five days out on average in the past, you know, several several hurricane season that's been the average. Just keep in mind that. Professional meteorologists are doing the best they can at the Hurricane Center with the information they have, and uh, these storms are very complex and have a mind of their own. So I want to pause here for questions real quick. Um, thanks for everyone who are tuning in. If you have any questions, feel free to, to comment down. Um, Teresa said, a little better news for all of our Greyhound friends for now. Yes, that is good news. It doesn't look like Central Florida is going to be hit as hard. Um, again, I'll, I'll caution you to say, you don't want to rule anything out yet. One of um, the models earlier actually had still making landfall around Cape Canaveral and then s tracing the coast up here. So they're not out of the woods yet, but certainly better looking, a, a better outlook for those people. Um, Liza says, I'm concerned if it slows down even more. Yeah, it, it's a very, it seems kind of hard to do. I've, I've X'd out, uh, I've closed out the tab with the satellite image, but I'll pull it back up at the end of my broadcast in about 20 minutes or so. And, um, it's hard to imagine the hurricane just kind of moving around and then it's stalling. 
Um, it, it's happened a few times, but it is possible that it's going to slow down, but it's, it's, I mean, you have to think the hurricane's a heat engine. It is literally an engine. It's a heat engine in the atmosphere, and there's massive amounts of energy in it. And to slow a storm down that big is like trying to stop an ocean liner. It's, it's a very uh, resilient system. Uh, Dorian has become so strong now that instead of being influenced by other factors in the atmosphere, it is the influencing factor in the atmosphere. And that is a big deal because it can actually, the interplay between other uh, ridges and troughs in the atmosphere are kind of succumbing to Dorian's force now because it's a stronger system. It can influence others and then that can create a feedback loop that changes the forecast even more. So these systems are very unique in how they interact with the rest of the environment around them. And, you know, I would caution to, to say anyone's out of the woods yet until this storm is cleared. Um, North Carolina and Bermuda, I, uh, I want to caution anyone to, to think that they're safe from an impact. Um, yeah, the Bahamas, I'm very concerned about the out islands of the Bahamas up here. Uh, the Grand Bahama Island that's home to, I think, 57,000 people or more. Uh, and then Abaco Island is a lot of smaller islands. And these aren't mountainous islands like in the Caribbean. I think the maximum elevation on one island is 40 feet. Um, so that that's, you know, a sand dune. That That's not going to substantially impact Dorian. And there's nothing in Dorian's way from maintaining its strength before it reaches the islands, which is very unfortunate so uh my heart goes out to those people down there you can't evacuate an island in a series you know a couple, a couple of days um they had a couple of days notice for this storm you can't evacuate an island to fifty thousand people so uh we'll have to watch we can hope that dorian skirts north of those islands and doesn't give them the worst impacts looks mostly like an eastern and coastal north carolina storm it looks that way for now cindy uh i you know that's the way it looks currently uh, there's no real evidence to corroborate that or to say otherwise, but yeah, it does look like eastern North Carolina, again, will kind of get the short end of the stick and will have heavier rain, especially in the inner banks or the tidewater area, as some people refer to it as, um, you know, I, I, Hyde County, Terrell County, Plymouth, uh, uh, excuse me, Washington County, Beaufort County, uh, you know, of course, New Hanover County, Brunswick County, Onslow County, Carteret County, the outer banks, you know, um, Pamlico County down here. Craven County, New Bern, um, all these areas are still at risk of having, you know, very high winds and gust up to, you know, hurricane force or possible, even if the storm remains offshore, it's going to grow in size as now I want to caution you to say that the cone does not indicate that the storm's going to grow in size, but as it weakens, it will disperse its energy outward and grow in size. The larger cone is for the, the greater uncertainty and it's expected to weaken because as it comes up the coast here, it's going to be moving so slow that it actually draws up cooler water from the bottom of the ocean, and it kind of mixes the ocean up too well, and then it starts ingesting cooler water that's already been mixed. So it's actually kind of hurting itself by slowing down, which is great news because it weakens the storm. So um, when the storm slows down, that's bad for flooding, but it's good for the long-term intensity forecast because if Dorian is sitting, you know, here 2 p.m. tomorrow through 2 p.m. Tuesday and only moves you know about 100 miles it's churning up the same water and it can't derive any energy from that ocean water anymore so it's slowing down is bad for the flooding uh, forecast but it's also good because it weakens the system because it's reusing the same water in its circulation so that's why it's expected to weaken as it comes up here and it's going to pass west of the Gulf Stream which cuts east of Florida and goes up so it's going to be slightly cooler water it's going to be interacting with land a lot more so that's why it's expected to kind of uh, weaken a bit but when I say weaken I use that word very lightly um, you remember Hurricane Florence it was a category one when it made landfall and it was tremendously impactful impacts are not based on categories they're based on the position of the the hurricane to land so that is um, thank you Kathy thanks for your kind words uh, Ruth says so glad Florida won't take a direct hit for now it looks that way. Um, it's still very possible that it could drift inland. Uh, you know, I caution, I want to caution you to uh, be wary of that. There's very likely this afternoon's guidance has actually supported maybe an adjustment by the Hurricane Center at the 11 p.m. update to adjust the track westward a little bit. Um, so they're not out of the woods yet. So just uh, don't let your guard down just yet. Dorian is still. Um, and and to, to reiterate that, I want to pull up this tweet from Levi Cowan. He runs Tropical Tidbits. It's a great website. I would recommend donating to him to keep his website up and running. And this is a very important tweet. Uh, weak steering currents and stalling storms should never be trusted. You should have trust issues with them. And that's because with 72 hours before Dorian turns north, even a one mile per hour 
error in the storm speed and the models until then could result in a 72 mile per hour or 72 mile error in how far west dorian gets if the storm is moving one pop one mile per hour and or let's say the model has it moving one mile per hour but dorian in reality is moving two miles per hour that storm's going to end up 72 miles west of its modeled position and that's a big deal 72 miles in this forecast means the difference between uh you know uh, light damage, light wind damage, and lighter rain totals, and major hurricane conditions for Florida. So just keep that in mind. Um, we're not out of the woods yet. Stay vigilant. Uh, more changes could occur. It's a tough one. It's a tough forecast. You hear that a lot. That's because it is. It's a very, very challenging forecast. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Do you think Wilmington will get hit hard? Hit hard. I, th I am a little concerned for Wilmington right now, and I want to pull up the storm surge map, and I'll show you why so this is from the coastal emergency risk assessment it is run i think out of university of chapel hill if i'm not mistaken i'm going to credit all of these in the video so you'll have links if you want to go back and look for yourself um, but i want to follow the track and kind of show you this is a great tool for looking at potential storm surge and jonathan i see your question i'll get to you in just a moment and it has um, these swells where dorian is expected to go and you see these really vibrant colors between the bahamas here so we have grand bahama island you have freeport a very populated city. You have a northern Abaco Island and southern Abaco Island, and you see all this water piling up between them, which is, is concerning because you'll have the hurricane or the major hurricane force winds at this point. It's category four hurricane. It's going to be sitting over the Bahamas. You have the rain falling from the sky, and you have the rain pushing in from the coast. Um, and when you have all this water piling up and uh, you know piling up against the coast, I'm very concerned for flooding issues down in this uh, smaller Abaco Island and then on the eastern side of, of Grand Bahama Island as well. A very scary situation for them. And then even while you're going up the coast here, you see these colors, you know, getting warmer. Even up in uh, coastal Georgia, up here in Tybee Island, Savannah, Charleston, um, all, all still at play here. Even this little nook where Georgetown, um, so south of Myrtle Beach down here. And the reason why these colors are showing up here for storm surge, the storm is going in this direction so it's rotating like this and i want you to stick with me this is a kind of a thought experiment here the storm is rotating counterclockwise as it goes up this track so it's continuously pushing water against the shoreline and it's evacuating some of the water but remember that the component of the well i didn't mean to do that there the component of the the direction of the storm that's moving east is south of the storm so ahead of dorian we're going to have a lot of water being pushed up against the coast as it goes north so with i'm going to clear this and draw a better better picture here so if you have um, your hurricane here and if you have your hurricane well here we go if you have your hurricane here and it's pushing up water against the coast before it arrives and then it does not recede until after it already passes so as dorian moves up to here it'll push water ahead of it on the coast as well so there could still very well be a, a big coastal flooding issue with dorian as it moves up even if it doesn't make a landfall and actually in terms of coastal flooding this is a a much <sighs> I don't want to say worst case scenario, but this is going to cause more extensive flooding over a larger area. Now, if Dorian was coming into the coast, you know, this way, excuse my badly drawn tropical cyclone figure there. If it's coming this way, then it's just pushing the wall of water in a concentrated area. And I'm not saying it's going to hit Charleston. I'm just using this as an example. So keep that in mind. If it's coming directly perpendicular to the coastline, there's a smaller area that gets affected. But if Dorian is tracing this area as it's going up this way it's continuously pushing water against the coast so there could be some moderate flooding from you know jacksonville florida all the way up to the coastal carolina so as, as far as wilmington's concerned there's still the possibility for some some flooding along you know topsail beach um you know still it's, it can't be ruled out uh, topsail beach up here wrightsville beach crystal coast um, down here in the myrtle beach Still a possibility for some some flooding in there, and then of course you have the rains. Um, if the storm is centered here, you're going to have you know very strong hurricane winds as well. So this is a very interesting site. I like to look at it. Shows the potential of the water from the ocean on top of the impacts from the uh, hurricane wind speeds in this graphic. You can I'm gonna leave it here. So you have the wind speeds in concert with the wave action and the coastal flooding. And then you have the rainfall on top of that. So it's a triple threat storm. Uh, thanks for tuning in, Angel and Terry. 
uh, Jonathan, any chance it comes inland in North Carolina? That's that's unlikely uh, with Florence. I'll go back to the, the track here. With Florence, it was coming in perpendicular to North Carolina and kind of made this weird track and then curved back out, made it kind of a sickle shape. Um, with Dorian, it's tracing the coast. It'll be more of a Matthew-like track where it curves out to sea. It's very unlikely that it will you know, shoot up into North Carolina this way. It's likely to kind of give us a glancing blow and turn out, but it is possible that it could ride inland. So what I, what I mean by that, it could cut inland and then trace up this way. So in that manner, it could come inland to North Carolina, but it's not going to you know, shoot off toward the, the Piedmont Triad or the Charlotte area. Um, it's not going to go farther inland than that because we have a trough that's building over in the uh, central United States, and it's going to be pushing Dorian off this way. So there's no way the hurricane's going to go underneath that trough. So it's going to push it off. Um, so any effects in the Piedmont Triad and the Greensburg, Winston-Salem, High Point area, Charlotte area, Asheboro area, um, even Durham and um, Raleigh might be a little close, having a little bit higher winds. But anywhere in that area is just going to get the fringe effects based on um, the track of the storm. Uh, Hannah, thank you for your updates. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, may Dorian stay out of the Atlantic whenever it will do. Yeah, so um, that was a long comment. Sorry, I had to click a little see more area. You know, it's... It, I hope it stays out in the Atlantic, but at the same time, we can't let our guard down because that does indeed still leave leave the problem. And I want to show you this, and I want to end with this and start wrapping up because I look I'm, I'm approaching 30 minutes here, um, and I want to keep the the content brief. But I'm going to leave this model unnamed because it doesn't really matter what model is showing what. I just want to show you a situation. Uh, a lot of people get too hung up on which model is doing what and the credibility of certain models in the past. Each storm's different. Um, each storm's going to be modeled differently, so take that with a grain of salt. So uh, this model is showing geopotential height. So the red colors indicate higher areas in the atmosphere, and blue indicates lower pressure. So again, we're going to use our pot of water example. If you have a pot of water on your stove, and you take a large uh, mixing spoon, and you have water in it, that's supposed to be water, and you you know, swirl and swirl and swirl around and you make the perimeter of that water or the circumference of that water in the pot go faster, what happens to the middle of the water? It goes down. It creates a whirlpool. You're lowering the pressure in the middle of the uh, pot of water to equate for the faster wind speeds on the edge. So that's why you have an area of lower pressure here. Um, if you're, you're looking into the screen, imagine this being like you take a, a pin and you kind of stab it into your computer screen or, or phone screen. Um, imagine this is like a big hole and the screen is being pushed down toward Earth because the wind speeds around Dorian are pushing down, so the pressure is lower. So this blue color indicates that. And uh, what I was talking about earlier, hurricane hunters don't just investigate the storm, they investigate the area all around the storm to understand what environment it's in. And this is a, a ridge, it's going to be a ridge, and what's happening, Dorian is rotating counterclockwise in this manner. And around a ridge, it's the opposite, it rotates in this manner. So right now, it's kind of, well, also another important factor, there's an upper level low down here, which is um, going that way, it rotates the same way as Dorian. So you kind of have this conveyor belt pushing Dorian in to eastern Florida. But what happens if we go forward in time, you see this ridge kind of expand and go down here. So now it has flow that is going around and then up this way. So it's creating kind of a, a blockage. A stop sign is being thrown up for Dorian here and it slows down and it continues to do so. But that ridge kind of breaks down and then a weakness opens up. Here's a big uh, trough we have in the north, and here's a big area of high pressure, and here is too, but there's a weakness. So Dorian tries to escape and goes northward, and then as we go forward in time, that ridge gets stronger, builds this way, and then Dorian is forced out to sea. So there's a lot of moving parts here. There's a lot going on uh, that can that can alter that. And I, you know, I show you that in rapid succession. That shows you how complicated the forecast is. It's expected to, you know, come toward the Bahamas. It just has it sitting over the Bahamas for several several hours, about a day and a half, and then jogging north and going back out to sea. In this particular model, uh, this would be the center of Dorian, maybe about 50 miles off the coast of North Carolina, still causing some really high winds in uh, the coastal plain of the state. So we're not out of the woods yet, still need to prepare. 
I'm going to do a video tomorrow, a series of videos probably, or live streams talking about preparedness kits and how to prepare for power outages. If you have irrigation systems in your lawn, on your lawn, turn them off tonight because there's a lot of water coming your way in the coastal plain of North Carolina. Uh, make sure, you know, you've reviewed, uh, there are still people recovering from Florence and even Matthew. Um, so this is, you know, this is kind of raw for, for people who've already lost their homes to that and places like that. So we have to keep those people in mind that they're, you're always forecasting the last storm. When you bring up a hurricane, Florence immediately pops into those people's minds and all of the, the bad things that came with it. So there's, you know, there's an emotional component to hurricanes that a lot of people don't see. And that's when it gets really hard to forecast these things because they change people's lives and they're very uh, inclusive storms. And it's a very serious situation. It's not something to take lightly. I've been saying this the past couple of days, the threat level doesn't get higher for, for North Carolina in terms of a uh, a hurricane, uh, you know, glancing past, glancing past the state and kind of giving us a, a skirt by here. So, you know, what else are you going to be, if, if you're prepared and the storm goes out to sea, you're still prepared for the next storm. There's no harm in trying to prepare for the storm. And it's a great practice to do. And you can make it into a family activity. You can make it fun. Uh, you can make it worth your while and you're prepared for the next storm. So, uh, I'm going to talk about that, but in terms of actual impacts, we, we still don't know. I want to, um, pull up this satellite composite uh, once again just to end on this note with Dorian and see what uh, the storm is doing now. So we have this very high definition area of Dorian over here. I'm going to put the latitude and longitude on here. Again, so uh, Dorian continues to go and I'm going to lengthen this as well. So Dorian's continuing to kind of just do its thing and churn. There's nothing really in its way to weaken it as um, it approaches the Bahamas. So we're going to see what happens um, and hopefully it starts to take a northward jog in its track and that the current track will verify um, that's the current look we have it's a very healthy hurricane and it's very uh, frightening that it has maintained its strength even uh, even though it's gone gone over an area with kind of lower heat potential in the water so it's kind of defied those odds and has maintained its strength and it's kind of at a steady state and it's just kind of going along and we have to hope that it skirts north of the grand bahama island and abaco island and that the current forecast here verifies and we are left with, um, you know, just just some rain and gusty winds uh, across the southeastern U.S. over the next couple of days. But we have to monitor and stay vigilant because it looks like Dorian will have some adverse impacts for hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people. So we have to keep watching. And I think I'm going to end here. Uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in. If you have any questions, feel free to comment on this Facebook post. Follow me on Twitter at Andrew WX Center um, altogether. Uh, and you can I'm post these videos to YouTube immediately after if you want to go back and watch. Uh, I post the links to them as well if you want to check them out yourself. And I will be doing my best to keep you all updated on what Dorian is doing and what it means for us here in North Carolina. So thanks for watching and stay safe.